This is Ask with your host, Michelle Martin, on 938 Live. Very special welcome to a very special edition of Ask, where you get to know the person behind the public office. I'm Michelle Martin. It's such a privilege to have with us Minister of State for Manpower and National Development, Tan Chuan Jin. Good Thanks to have you with us. On the show. Now, we're asking you to call in as well at 669 Tell us what it means to be Singaporean to you. We are discussing the Singapore identity today. What do you miss most about Singapore when you are abroad? Share views with us. Uh, Minister Tan, tell us, you know, there are several views, uh, schools of thought when it comes to this idea of the national identity. One is that it's evolving, it's nascent. Another, that Singapore is still struggling a little with articulating a sense of identity. What does a Singaporean identity mean to you? Well, I, I do think that we we have a sense of identity, um, it, but it does vary from person to person because it, it invariably it is unique. Individuals have to decide for themselves what it means. It's not something that the state can define and therefore that's the identity. It's mm-hmm. not something that our parents tell us, but it has to grow. It's something that all of us have to reflect on and to think about what it means. There will be, I think, common traits that we share, common values, common perspectives, um, but collectively, all of us will have to decide what it means to us individually. And, and to me, I I do believe that there is a sense of identity. Often when we talk about how our forefathers came, uh, and they were immigrants themselves, but at that stage, you know, they came here, I don't think many of them necessarily thought that they would make this place their home. A lot of them were looking at going back. But over time... You know, with the passage of time and things happening uh, in our history, we have, I think, grown and developed a sense of what it means. To me, the sense of a national identity is really about relationships. Um, It's like when you use an analogy of a house. You can build a house, the foundation is important, the roof over your head, uh, the facilities and so on. These are important. But ultimately, what makes it a home really is about the relationships. It's about a lot of the intangible things such as the memories that you have growing up in the place and the relationships within your family, the relationships with the people around you, your friends, ultimately that's what makes this place home. And all of us have a semblance of that. And the key, I guess, is how do you continue to foster it, how do you continue to nurture it and to strengthen this collective sense of uh, what it means to be Singaporean. Well, Share with us a little bit of the sense of being Singaporean and what, what it means particularly to you. Well, I think we, every country is unique. I like to think that Singapore is also unique in many ways. Uh, we have, from history, defied the odds. We do have limitations, uh, just as other countries do, but we have managed. We have managed to stay afloat, and not just stay afloat, but to provide for ourselves as, and fairly well for ourselves and our families. But importantly, I think there's a very strong sense of compassion. Um, Singaporeans do care a great deal. In fact, today, just having come from the accident site in Bugis, um, there have been people who have uh, messaged me about how they thought that they would like to step forward and help to raise money for those who are injured and so on. And we see a lot of that in moments of crisis. Uh, And it's actually very common today when you read in the papers of families who are adversely affected. And many Singaporeans actually step forward to help. We have on the ground many... VWOs, many unofficial VWOs, people being involved, and I see that even in my own community, um, people coming forward and deciding to take things into their own hands to help those who do need help. And you see a lot of that happening all over. There's a lot of a lot more active citizenship today as well. People taking up uh, issues uh, that they feel passionate about, mm-hmm. and all these things are important in the makeup of a country. Again, it's not unique. Um, Other countries have that as well, but what makes it unique is really the context. It's happening here. It revolves around issues that are peculiar to us, that we are familiar with. And ultimately, collectively, all that adds up to a sense of fighting for something you believe in, struggling for issues that you care passionately about. And that, to me, is really about caring for the environment, caring for the makeup of your society, of your nation. And that's something to celebrate. So it sounds like you think this idea of engagement is important? I think if you're disengaged and apathetic, you really don't care enough. Uh, and the fact that people are engaged, stepping forward and being vocal, and we can always agree to disagree, but that's an important first step. And you see a lot of that happening uh, all over, You know, not just with the young, but also with uh, Singaporeans at various age groups. And that's something that we should celebrate. And I guess 
as a government as well, and I would say that she's not just a government's responsibility, but as a society, we have to figure out how to navigate that space. How, as we are fighting for our respective causes, how do we find a common space? Because ultimately, as with all issues, we don't always have, uh, we have different views, but there are common spaces that we can um, identify, and then to create those common spaces and to celebrate the things that we share. Minister Tan, you studied at the London School of Economics. You trained at Britain's Royal Military Academy Centres. Did you feel this sharpened sense of being Singaporean when you studied and lived abroad? Yes, I do. I think every time I'm away from home, I feel that quite acutely. Uh, at a very practical level, it's just a contrast often with uh, the way things work. Uh, here, things do work. Uh, not perfectly, obviously, but... Um, works most of the time, it works pretty well. Um, and having lived abroad, lived in the UK for quite a number of years in the States, uh, whether training or uh, in school, uh, it's something you appreciate. Uh, but m- more importantly, is really, again, it comes back down to relationships. It's about home is really where your friends are, where your family is. My family is here. Many of my friends are here, or even though a number of them have studied abroad as well. But And... This is where I grew up. I have fond memories of places, some of which have been developed and they're not there. But they are unique memories. Um, and all of us have very unique memories of us growing up. The food that we eat, the smells, um, you know, little peculiar things that sometimes just resonate with you. And collectively, these are the things which I think bind you to a place that gives you a sense of being who you are, being in the sense of being Singaporean. And that's something that all of us have in varying uh, degrees and, and all fairly unique in their own ways, but all anchored on this place, all anchored in this society, all anchored in the, through the passage of time that we've passed through. And we all have shared moments, uh, shared experiences. And that's ultimately, I guess, a sense of that identity and how there is a shared perspective and how I guess we born and feel this collective sense of being Singaporean and that's something that we continue to have to work at economic growth and so on that's important but it is really a means to an end it, it is not an end in itself this is just providing a basis a foundation for us individuals to be able to fulfill our aspirations but ultimately it is a hardware I think as what Halima shared in her previous conversations here is about the kampung spirit it's about it's about knowing your neighbours, it's about strengthening your family bonds, it's about knowing the people around you. And when you begin to know people, you reach out and you give of yourself to society. And that's where things begin to change. And you no longer are just a bystander, but you're an active participant in a place that you, know, you call home. You shared with me earlier on that the identity is based on little peculiar things. Can you share with me some little peculiar things you miss most about Singapore when you were living abroad? Food. Well, food isn't very peculiar, but <laughs> we do have very peculiar food in the sense of it being fairly unique, although Malaysia also has quite a lot of this similar kinds of food. But um, food is, is one one feature, um, certainly friends, and and I guess memories. Growing up in school, you know, the silly things that you do in school, and from time to time when you, you meet up with old friends, like I just met up with our council friends, from RJC this, uh, 20, 25 years ago you know, and, and it was great because this is um, for a number of us first time we've met each other and then we reminisce about the things that we used to do in the council room playing carom you know, sitting and watching the trains go by or cycling you know at night I, we didn't seem to be studying a lot but, <laughs> but things like that brings you know just brings back smiles and laughter and and it's a part of our lives. It's no longer there. It's moved on. But it's you know it's forever up there in your in 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 your memory space. And it's a shared memory space because you share that with your friends. And we have countless memories with so many people that have crossed our paths over the years. And that really is ultimately, I think, what makes the difference. You know, it's sort of no longer just a geographical place. That just because you're born there, it's the people that you meet. And some people you are friends for life, and some people are just friends for a moment that you know where your paths cross, and that's that's what it is. But it's unique and it's special, and it's this collection of memories and collection of experiences which I think does make up a sense of you know what it means to be Singaporean. And there are also very unique things about our history, events that have shaped us, 
uh, momentous events, whether it's your independence, whether the different struggles that we've had, all those also make up, you know, who we are. And I would say it's not just from 1965 onwards, even before that, what happened during the Second World War, what happened in the early years, our pioneering fathers, all this make up a sense of that nation. Um, and But all of us need a personal perspective of it. We need our own interpretation of it and to internalize it mm. and to own that. Well, give us a ring at 669-11938 if you too would like to speak with Minister of State for Manpower and National Development, Tan Chuan Jin, and you can share with us uh, what it means to be Singaporean to you. What you miss most about Singapore when you are abroad, give us a ring and share your views with us. Uh, Minister, do you think, uh, do, you, do you feel fortunate to some extent to have been able to appreciate Singapore from the living abroad experience? I, I do, very much so. And it helps... Uh, not just traveling. Traveling, sometimes, you know, you, you go to another country, you see uh, aspects of it, but it's very different when you actually live in another country. Um, I would say that, unfortunately, in practically almost every country I've been, especially doing training or even short stints, I've always encountered fairly unpleasant experiences, such as people coming up and then taunting you on racist grounds. Maybe, maybe the problem is me. <laughs> but... Um, but it's it's something when you're here you you do feel that you're not a second class citizen. Yes. And it's something that I feel tremendously proud about that we do have a very multiracial society, multi religious. We have almost taken it for granted, which in a way is a good thing. Uh, but we still do, I believe, need to be conscious of it. But the fact that we can coexist, and I think not just coexist, but to live together, and to really feel that sense of pride. You see that. I mean, I remember when I was young and you, I was at the old national stadium watching football at the Malaysia Cup. And regardless of race, language or religion, you're just cheering for the Singapore team, um, you know, in the army. And, and the army is a very unique institution in Singapore as well, national service. Yes, uh, few and fewer countries in the world have national service. But for us, it's a important not just from a defense perspective, but from a social building perspective. It's one place where people of different ethnic backgrounds, different religions, in fact, different socioeconomic backgrounds, literally live together, go through hardship together. And you, you have a lot of complaints as well that you share. And, you, you know, it's always great to come back and then complain about, oh, you know, when I used to be in BMT and you know, what, what I went through. And it, it binds us. It creates common platforms. And I guess the key really is to find as many platforms as possible for different Singaporeans to interact and to create those shared moments and memories. And ultimately, it's that web of interactions that really binds and that makes this place unique. We are chatting with Minister of State for Manpower and National Development, Tan Chuan Jin, taking your calls as well at 669-11938 on Ask. We continue in just a while. This is Ask with your host, Michelle Martin, on 938 Live. And my guest this evening is Minister of State for Manpower and National Development, Tan Chuan Jin. And we will take your calls at 669-11938. And we are asking you to share with us what the Singapore identity means to you. Uh, Minister, tell us a little bit about your ideas on, on developing the Singapore identity. You mentioned it's evolving. It's something that we can expect to grow as we reflect on it. So how do we foster the sense of identity? I think a key component really is to encourage Singaporeans to step forward. I said to give of yourself to society. Um, in many ways, it's not complex. It's just being involved, uh, taking an interest in what's happening around you. Simple steps would be really even just within your local community. Um, for example, where I am in Kamangan Chai Chi, I do have a lot of low-income families, elderly, and I and we are reaching out to see how do we materially um, make a difference to the quality of lives of the people there, and especially for the low-income children. How do we help them break out of the cycle? And it's not just about reaching out to help them, but it's also providing that as a platform for the neighbours to participate, for the other residents who live in much better conditions and who are much more privileged to play a part in actually helping fellow Singaporeans to have empathy, to understand the challenges that others face and to be involved. And I see that happening in schools, uh, the CIP program, um, where students are expected to clock. Yes, I know that they have to clock X number of hours in order to secure a number of points, but I, I've gone past that stage because I think without those points, a lot of parents may not support their kids doing uh, those activities. But I can see a lot of children, and I see that in my children, being actually caught up in the whole process of volunteering and helping. 
and they begin to see beyond the confines of their own circumstance. They understand issues a bit broader. And because they begin to care for others, I think the change happens. Because you begin, rather than just as I always feel, being just a passenger and just a spectator, you become part of the landscape. And even simple things like just taking part in community activities, getting to know your neighbours. You know, sometimes we deal with neighbour disputes. Someone on the fourth floor, we're complaining about the neighbour on the fifth floor with the clothes that are dripping. But the moment they get to know that neighbour, suddenly the clothes are still dripping, but it's a bit different because, oh, well, you know, I kind of know that guy. It's actually quite all right. And relationships change everything. And really it's a matter of strengthening family bonds, which I think is really important. And then unit by unit, floor by floor, block by block, street by street, and you begin to see how do you strengthen those networks. And the networks in school, the networks through various platforms that you can come up with, being involved in causes that you feel strongly about, and you establish those relationships. And that's really how, I guess, you begin to strengthen that sense of being part of a larger fabric. And you are part of that, playing an active role. And because you're active, you begin to have emotional ties. Your emotional ties begin to deepen and that's ultimately, you know, I, I don't know what that identity is exactly, but there's a sense of that. And and really that's something that I guess what we're trying to do at a community level. But it's something that I do ask Singaporeans to just take the initiative, you know, get away from the keyboard and just typing away. And, and we know that there's a lot of some cynicism and negativity, but I would rather let's just take ownership of the society we live in, of the country that we live in, and really build something and do something about it. And it's well within our abilities to do that. And we, and it just, you just need to take the first step and reach out. And if everybody does that, I think society also slowly will begin to change. We have some listeners who want to reach out to you now, Minister Tan. So uh, we're going to hear from Jason, who joins us on the line. Jason, you have a question for Minister? Oh, unfortunately, Jason could not wait, apparently. Mr. Lee, yeah, you have on. a question on immigration. Oh, or, no, it, it's just that, like, uh, as a Singaporean, I feel very proud to be one. Like, especially, I'm quite happy with uh, things like what, what, what was run in Singapore in the 80s and 90s where we have job security and like, uh, I mean a lot of like uh, PMET, they are not worried about losing their jobs even when they are in their forties. But now, like among my friends, they are quite unhappy about what is going on because first of all, uh, we felt that the government is more pro-foreigners than Singaporeans and they don't really protect jobs. Like once you get retrained in the forties, some of them is like difficult to get jobs because all the companies got their leeway to get higher on the foreigners and on this. Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Lee. Looks like we got the gist of your question. Well, thank you, Mr. Lee, for your uh, question and your concerns. Mm. Uh, um, maybe first off, I would say this: uh, at the centre of everything that we do, must be focused on Singaporeans, and must be focused on our society. It has to be focused on how it impacts us today and how it impacts us for the long term. It will not make sense for us to create policies to be orientated towards benefiting foreigners. At the end of it, it is all about how it helps and provides for Singaporeans. So the concerns that you have uh, is something that we do here um, in terms of jobs. Um, but what we do know in Singapore today, if, for example, we do have very low unemployment Comparatively, uh, I've been to Europe, I've talked to a lot of my counterparts. Um, in comparison, unemployment is tremendously high in many other countries. Why is this important? Well, jobs in itself, it's something I feel very strongly about personally, even though we may have 2.7, 2.8% unemployment, but that's about 50 over 1,000 Singaporeans. It's not just an individual that's affected, but families. So it's important that we provide economic growth not for its own sake, but because when the economy is growing, companies are able to exist, they can do well, and it is companies that provide jobs. And I, I deal with a lot of Singaporean companies. In fact, I speak to a lot of Singaporean employers, and they have also very strong perspectives about how we are tightening up the labour market, which we think is the correct thing to do. It's a fine balance, because when we have a diverse, dynamic workforce, it also allows companies to be here. It is not cheap to operate in Singapore. Labour, in relative terms, costs more. 
uh, here than, say, in Indonesia and Philippines, certainly in China. Uh, rentals cost more as well and compared to some other countries. But companies are prepared to locate themselves here because of stability, the certainty, there's a diverse workforce. But because they're here, they're also at the same time creating jobs for our people. But if we have a much more closed society, then regional headquarters by its nature or global headquarters, for example, where you do need a diverse workforce to populate their, their setups, will then find that perhaps it doesn't make sense to be here. So what happens when they go? The jobs that they provide directly will go. And there are a lot of associated businesses that actually create jobs for Singaporeans that support those industries will also be affected. So we understand the emotional tensions that are involved, um, but we are calibrating, we are tightening up. But at the same time, we do know that we, we need to maintain that fairly open structure because it helps companies be here and on balance the fact that we are continue we are continue uh, we can continue to be able to provide good jobs and good jobs opportunities uh, that's something that remains important but it's something that we need to grapple with because we do get different perspectives uh, Singaporean workers PMETs uh, older Singaporeans employers themselves also do feel uh, slightly different concerns as we tighten up but it's a it's a journey that we need to navigate um, but I would want to assure the public and to assure Mr. Lee as well that at the heart of this really is about providing for our people. And when it no longer provides for our people, and that's when the policy doesn't make sense and we need to adjust and we need to change, and that we will if that happens. Thank you for addressing that. Minister of State for Manpower and National Development, Tan Chuan Jin. Ask continues after Headline News Sports and Business. Stay with us. This is Ask with your host, Michelle Martin, on 938 Live. Your chance to ask Minister of State for Manpower and National Development Tan Chuan Jin a uh, question as well. And you can share your views on what it means to be Singaporean, what you miss most about Singapore when you're abroad. Share your views with us at 669-11938. So we're getting to know Minister Tan. It's a real privilege to have him in the studio sharing a uh, part of his you know, personal identity with us. So tell us a little bit about you playing football, I understand. You're a footballer yourself? Or is that a Function. hobby? I'm not a footballer. I, Would you call I, I yourself? I play football. I enjoy play football. I, <laughs> I enjoy watching. Um, so it's something I, 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 we play. I mean, we have a parliament team, um, although I haven't played often with them. played with my ministry team as well. So that's fun. I mean, it's um, a it's good exercise and it's uh, just something you just get out to the field and it's a great opportunity to also meet other people. So, for example, in my ministry, we just, just joined the uh, Ministry of Manpower you know, colleagues to play a game the other day and I think it was a good time just to get to know them not just formally at work but informally as well mm. and it was something I did at school although our school wasn't very strong in football and get regularly uh, clobbered by other schools but it's it's um, something I just enjoy doing Do you think sports is a real unifier and really has a ability to bring people together in terms of fostering a sense of Singapore identity? De definitely so um, there are many activities sports is definitely one of them certainly football in Singapore and like I said earlier I, I remember being at the National Stadium watching the Malaysia Cup and I always felt that not being part of the Malaysia Cup was actually a big loss and I, I'm really glad that we're now back you know, into the fall and being part of that because it was great to see Singaporeans coming together to cheer the Singapore team against Pahang, Selangor and so on. And in the same way, I mean, there are emerging sports as well. Uh, and you can see how Singaporeans rally around and celebrate when we succeed and or when a the team puts up a good fight. And these, again, are the little things that you know create moments for us, uh, instill that sense of pride in, in whichever, whatever shape and form. And I said, cumulatively, all these little experiences all add up to being a sense of, you know, who you are. And when you see your, your country's flag being flown and the anthem being sung when, you know, your, your teams win medals, um, and you feel that sense of, oh, this is really great. And I think that's something that we should celebrate. And we shouldn't be shy about being proud of who we are, what we have achieved, uh, you know, as a nation, of our institutions, of our personalities. Uh, we really need to, I think, separate the politics from the nation. We may not be happy, for example, with policies or sometimes from the political perspective. I always felt very strongly, for example, when I was organizing National Day, that it is a day that belongs to all of us, regardless of your political affiliation and perspectives. And we should be proud of who we are, what we've achieved, and where we might be going. 
Well, I understand you are chairman of the executive committee for the National Day Parade. If there is one show here in Singapore that is such a wonderful display of the Singaporean identity, it is the National Day Parade. Uh, tell us a little bit about the pledge moment, the very special 2009 National Day pledge moment. Um, well, I guess when I was arrowed, well, when I was tasked <laughs> to be uh, responsible for organizing National Day Parade 09, one of the first things... <clears throat> As with all things I do, is to collectively with my team uh, ask ourselves, what are we really doing this for? And I guess the moment when we drop the P from the NDP and actually just focus on National Day, it actually began to look very differently. The National Day Parade is important. It's it's an event. It's a, it's a, it's an occasion. There's a lot of history behind it, um, but it's a focal point. It's really the journey getting there. It's about how you bring a whole nation together. And, and the focus from, for myself wasn't about the Singaporeans who balloted for the tickets because they were, I guess, converted and they were sold on it. It was the rest of the Singaporeans who maybe, oh, no, this is a long weekend. Shall we go to Bintan or go to Ganting? And who feel that, oh, another big propaganda event. Um, but, you know, the truth of the matter is it is our day of independence. You know, if we don't celebrate this, really no one else will. And... Why don't we just spend the time leading up to it or in the day itself to reflect on actually what does it really mean to celebrate our National Day, to be who we are? And and the pledge was something I felt strongly about because it's something that we recite every day, you know, and we, we can, you know, just recite it in our sleep. But we don't always pause to think about what the words mean. And I, I do actually think the words uh, mean a tremendous amount. It's really meaningful. And I remember, um, so why, why the pledge moment came about was that we anchored a lot of the ideas along the pledge. And I remember a friend of mine, um, Bernard Tan, he passed away a number of years ago um, during a biathlon. He was always very passionate about organizing you know, events like National Day because he felt it was an event that was important and it was a great opportunity to bring people together. And I remember speaking to him in, um, I think, 03 or 04 when he was a show chairman. He said, you know, it would be great if we... It was usually at the end of National Day parades, you will recite the pledge and sing the anthem. And what if we uh, started this thing and, you know, get the SCDF sirens to sound and the whole of Singapore just stopped and everybody recite the pledge. And we were like, you know, it's, you know, it's mad. Nobody's going... Singaporeans just don't do things like that. But I remember that incident vividly. And, and when we you looked at the pledge as an anchoring idea, and we thought, why don't we actually do it? Because like I said the focus wasn't just about Singaporeans who were there. Actually, how do we, uh, the rest of the Singaporeans at home, overseas, elsewhere, can actually participate? And again, it's about being part of something, not just watching, but to participate and to just spend the time when you recite the pledge to really just say what you mean and mean what you say. And we thought that that was a potentially powerful idea, but we were also very scared whether it would actually take off. Because Singaporeans are quite reserved in their own way. No, nobody's just going to stop and just recite the pledge. But then how do you then bring it about? How do you start a whole movement? So you've got the pledge mobs, you prepare the shopping malls, you've got the different groups. And it was tremendous. And, and you could see various people participating. Some of my young officers came back. They were in Marina Shopping Mall, in the shopping centre, in the food courts or wherever. And there were people who just actually did stop. And actually, as a whole group recited the pledge, and it was from I wasn't there, but tremendously moving from what I gathered. Even our naval ships, some of our, my navy colleagues on a ship out in South China Sea, they gathered on board. And at that moment, uh, on that that year was at eight twenty-two. And so, when you recite the pledge about we, the citizens of Singapore, pledge ourselves as one united people, and you imagine all around Singapore, all around the world, there are Singaporeans out there pledging themselves. And it is, you know, it's really has then, you know, kind of a experience, and and that's what it's about. It's trying to capture a sense of what it means, the emotions involved, and to be proud of it, and to celebrate it. And I guess that's really where we decided that the NDP really wasn't about NDP. It was really about National Day, and and we began to have a lot of outreach. And I think we've begun to take that approach for a lot of our National Day events. And I think that's that's a great thing. And it's good to see that the pledge is something, it's, it's become a feature. And I do urge Singaporeans to participate because, you know, with your family and just pause and really think about what we are pledging. And it was great to see it being debated in Parliament as well. I remember discussing with Viswa about, at length about this issue and he was an MP and he raised it in Parliament. It was quite heated. 
uh, discussion, even MM, then MM also came on board. But that's exactly what it is about, to actually ask ourselves, what are we really saying? What are we pledging ourselves to? And I believe that a pledge in many ways is a statement of faith, is a affirmation, a vision, or whatever you might call it, but I think it represents, especially the first few words, the first couple, first line or so, about what it really is. It's about one united people, regardless of race, language, or religion. And that's really about the relationships. It's about us seeing ourselves as one. And that's what, I guess, building a home is all about. It's one of the most poignant, beautiful moments of the National Day Parade, I think. Um, but tell us a little bit about a decision that you made to join the people. Did you make a decision to join the People's Actions Party during the pledge moment? Well, I mean, I was asked um, whether I would consider um, stepping forward to take part in politics. Can you tell us a little bit about when this happened? Um, it, it was a long drawn process. I think for the longest time, my answer was no. Um, you, you could sense, I mean, society was changing for, for a while. You could see that, I mean, society, people were a lot more vocal. You, you, ex, you sort of expected intellectually and you know that the, the environment would be different. But it's still very different just, you know, knowing it and thinking you know it and, and living through it. And I felt that I could still actually continue to serve. And I feel very strongly as a Singaporean in, in serving my nation which is why in, in many ways I joined the army because it's something I felt that was important uh, as an institution to defend our country. But at the same time, you know, you, you do work with a lot of young Singaporeans and how do you build communities and build a nation through that? And that's something I felt passionately about. And I felt I could just continue actually without necessarily stepping into politics. Um, but the world is also changing. It's, it's becoming more challenging in many ways. And I suppose if I were to step forward... And, well, I suppose let the process run and to see whether the political party saw me suitable. And I suppose eventually they did. And, and I guess ultimately it's also whether the electorate would pick you. And I guess it's really serving in a different capacity. Um, and it's something I do feel that's important for us to take a responsibility. Uh, not just politics, but really as Singaporeans to step forward and try to make a difference to the society that we live in to the people around us and whether big in big areas or small areas the truth is all of us can make a difference if we really choose to and i suppose for myself it's very much a continuation of that sense of i guess responsibility and duty to do what i do and well, it's been slightly more than a year now so it's been interesting and but definitely meaningful well, tell us a little bit about the lessons. As you mentioned, it's been just over a year. Or so in terms of the learning curve, has it been steep for you? Uh, it has been. Um, in terms of policy work, uh, I guess, as with many things, it's really about applying your mind to it. It's about critical thinking. To, to me, I guess, from a leadership perspective, what do leaders do? You try to sense make. You build teams. Uh, I, I don't believe that. You know, just because you you become a minister and then suddenly there's great wisdom that comes with it. Um, it's, it's collective. You, it's about creating an environment where your colleagues uh, feel comfortable to share their perspectives because there's a lot of wisdom out there and it's also about why engagement is so important because how do you tap on the collective wisdom of Singaporeans out there and the views of which are valid and how do you incorporate that in? So it's how do you build a team? How do you try to sense, make uh, the concerns and also have the courage to make the decisions. Um, today we are buffeted quite constantly, uh, certainly online. A lot of Singaporeans are very vocal. Uh, they're not shy to articulate their views. I get that on my Facebook every day <laughs> on every other issue. Um, and you do take them on board uh, and try to have a sense of the emotions that people feel. But ultimately you need to make the call. And it's not you don't make a call because the majority feels it's like that or the minority, but what's the right decision for our people? What's the right decision for society, for the present and for the long term? And to have the courage to make the decision and try to carry the people along with it. There, there'll be people who won't be happy, who won't like it. Um, but that's that's normal of every appointment that we hold or where we have uh, responsibilities. But and but that's been meaningful. And But in particular, I, I enjoy working with my residents on the ground. And that's uh, something I, I enjoy a lot. Yes, I hear you really pound the ground on your jogs. We'll pick that up in just a bit. But uh, Jason joins us now. He'd like to speak with you, Minister Tan. Jason, go ahead. 
So, sir, good evening. Good I am evening. absolutely disappointed. My name is Jay, so I do know that you enjoy your time with the Brussels. The unfortunate reality is over my side. When this announcement made that the minister, whoever the MP is coming along, there will be somebody pumping us. We keep our doors wide open to welcome the minister or the MP into the house. But unfortunately, they'll just turn around and say, if you want to talk to me, you'll come down to this. Rather disgruntled, Jason, there. Sounds like he's a little bit um, up upset at having not been able to personally meet his minister on his rounds. You try to meet as many people as you can? I do. Um, <clears throat> as part of a regular outreach, um, I visit my residents in my blocks of flats, in my landed estate. With all my colleagues, uh, members of parliament, we do that. Um, in fact, the reception has been warm. I mean, from time to time, uh, we do encounter residents who perhaps are not so keen to speak to us. Um, but actually, a very small handful. In fact, I've been, I've been tremendously um, touched. I think by a lot of the warmth shown by my residents. Uh, I'm not sure about your particular experience, and I'm sorry that you encountered that. I'm not sure about the context, um, but certainly for myself, I value the time I have in my residents and the activities that we take part together, uh, the outreach that we 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 put in place to help the less privileged Singaporeans and and to bring on board other residents in my estate to participate in that process. And that's something I feel very strongly about. Um, and it's something that I think many of my colleagues do care a great deal about. Um, I guess from time to time, misunderstandings could happen. I don't know what happened in your case, but it's something that many of us do feel that it's an important part of our outreach. In fact, I, I had a resident who uh, was actually scolding me during the campaigning period last year because she felt, oh, I never see the MP but you know sometimes when we visit and i do have homes where people are not in but the next time around in fact recently a couple of i think one two months back when we visited she actually cooked a bowl of misiam for me so that was actually quite nice of her to do that i reminded her that i remember her scolding me <laughs> during the campaigning period but it's little things like that along the way which really reminds me that you know ultimately and in, indeed whether the resident voted for you or not my responsibility to do what i can listen to their Concerns and to change the things that I can. I can't accommodate everything. But in the same way with the larger population at large, there are a lot of issues that Singaporeans email to us. We try to deal with them as best as we can, but when we take on board the inputs, but ultimately we need to figure out what's the best way to go forward, uh, not just individually, but collectively as well. And we have to make those calls. And that's something that we are fully committed to doing. And, and like I said earlier, at the center of everything, it ha all the dots must connect back to whether it makes sense for Singaporeans, it makes sense for society. Because if it doesn't, then really that those policies are uh, probably off the mark. Minister, we just have two minutes left on the clock. I'd like to leave you with those two minutes to give us your closing remarks on your thoughts on the Singaporean identity. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think the Singaporean identity is alive and kicking. What exactly is it? I would say that it's something that actually all of us need to define for ourselves. Um, I, I remember that when I was organizing the National Day in '09, that it was important not to be prescriptive because you cannot tell people that they need to feel this way, think that way, but you create moments, you create opportunities, platforms for Singaporeans to decide. Even our theme song, you know, what do you see? It's, it's, it's a rhetorical, it's an open-ended question because it is about what you see in this place, what do you see around you, our pledge, what it means to you. Why, why are you proud to be Singaporean? What does a pledge mean to you? And that is a very personal response. But we are also at the same time tied up in this web of relationships that we all share, memories that we all share, experiences. And I think that collectively, with our own individual interpretation, makes up what it means to be Singaporean. And I think there is a sense of being Singaporean out there. And we should be proud of it. We should celebrate the things that we ought to be proud of and step forward and you know, work together in whatever capacities to really build a future that we can call our own and that we can provide for our children. Minister, it's been such a privilege. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. That's Minister of State for Manpower and National Development, Tan Chuan Jin. This has been Ask on 938 Live. I'm Michelle Martin.